Bethel was somewhere. We're kind of making a shift. Now, if you've been with us at Paragon for the last uh, nine and a half years, you know that generally when summer kicks in, we start a thing called At the Movies. And this year, we're going to do something a little bit different, kind of taking a shift from the movie thing. And we're going to go into something I used to do every summer, and that is make a mixtape. Now, I need to take just a moment and explain a mixtape to some of you because some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. Others of you have like, yeah, I kind of got the grasp of it. If you grew up in the 90s, you made mixed CDs. Uh, if you grew up in the 80s, you made mixtapes. And in the mixtapes, what they basically were is you had the opportunity to get all the songs that you wanted off of sometimes a record player, but other times it was off of the radio. And you had to listen for that perfect time when you knew the song was going to come on. You had to wait for the DJ to stop talking so you could hit record, and hopefully you got it before they shut off at the end. And you had to plan out that mixtape because it wasn't like a playlist today on your phone where you can just have ultimate space. You had to be very specific and know the time of the song, how much time was left on side A before it flipped over to side B. I mean, it was a very complicated process. And in a mixtape, sometimes you did it for yourself, so you could have songs that you could listen to, and sometimes you did it for that special someone. And you played that mixtape, and you said, here, baby, I just want you to know the songs I'm thinking about when I think about you, you know. And so that was kind of what the whole idea of a mixtape was. So what we're going to do this summer is, in July, we're actually going to look at those songs that fit for our soul. And that's going to be, we're going to be looking through the book of Psalms, and we're going to look at some of the different Psalms that are out there that really speak to our emotions that we have, both our anger and our joy, our, our happiness and our sadness. We're going to look at those in the month of July. And in August, we're going to look at the core feelings of Paragon Church, the core values, the core songs, the, the ones that are always stuck in our head, or at least should always be stuck in our head. And then, before we get to that, though, we have to learn how to make the mix. How do you make the mix in your life? And like I said, there's some complications in all of it, but what we're going to do is first, in, in it all, we're going to, starting in a couple of weeks, we're going to look at fast forward and rewind, because those are probably the two trickiest buttons there were. We're going to take a look back on Father's Day. As a matter of fact, if you're going to join us on Father's Day, and we would love to have you here, we're actually going to have a retro day, and we want to encourage you to wear some of you dads are already wearing it, but um, we're going to encourage you to wear some of your older clothing, you know, step back into the 80s, step back into the 90s, kind of have some fun with that on that day. We're going to be giving out beef jerky and having some fun stuff with the dads on that day. So make sure you're here for that. Then we're going to be doing some fast forward and we're going to be looking ahead. We're going to be looking ahead at what's coming up with Paragon, some of the things we're planning for the rest of the summer, some of the things we're really getting ready for for fall. And I'm not sure if you realize this, but we are only six months away from 2020. And that just kind of blows my mind a little bit. Maybe it does it for you as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to be looking ahead. We're also going to look at the button record. And that was the most important one. What are you listening to? What are you taking in? What are you holding on to? What are you really memorizing? And I got to think about this memorizing thing this week because I started looking through some playlist songs like, oh, what were the songs I put on my mixtape when I was a kid? I still remember the words to them because I looked them up on Google and I'm like, it's amazing how that stuff just gets stuck in your brain. What is it that we're having to get stuck in our brain? We're going to look at that at the end of June. But before we do, because it's the beginning of the summer, because I was looking at all those songs, I started thinking about slowing down. Because isn't our summer songs, aren't they just about slowing down? Isn't it about kind of, kind of taking back? I started looking at some of my favorite songs that were on there, and the first one that came to mind was Summertime. And I'm not talking about the Will Smith version. I'm talking about the Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong version. <laughs> and, and just the, the idea of the summer living is easy. And then I started thinking about the summertime blues, because there ain't no cure for it, right? Because I have to work, and I have to make money. In order to make money, I can't go out and hang out and spend that money. All of these kind of things started going through my mind. Otis Redding sitting on the dock of the bay may not be an actual summer song, but still one of those ones that just kind of takes you back to summer. And I began to think about some of the other ones, like Summer Breeze, that makes me feel fine. I know some of you guys are going to be singing that for the rest of the day. I've, yeah, you're all good with that. And uh, what about that summer of 69 that, that that Brian Adams just had to have in his life. And, and, and he, he sang about all the different things, and just about any Beach Boy song kind of fits into the category. And of course, I can go back to that childhood song, that 1991 summer hit by Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. He and DJ Jazzy Jeff singing Summertime. What, you guys, some of you are like, I know, I'm singing it in my head right now. It's the summertime. It's time to sit back and unwind. Isn't that what summertime's supposed to be about? But let me ask you a question. 
very honestly, right here, right now, how many of you guys sit back and unwind during summer? None of us. We like to think that that's what we're going to do. We like to think, oh, the kids are out of school. We're going to take a vacation. How many of you guys have a vacation plan that you're sort of dreading? Don't raise your hands. You're sort of dreading it because you're thinking, as soon as I get back, I'm going to need a vacation from my vacation. Doesn't that seem like we've we got this agenda planned out? I'm terrible about this. When it comes to planning out a vacation, I'm like, okay, we need to figure out where we're going to eat that New Mexico doesn't have. That's always on it. You always have to make that list. Okay, you know, if you're going to Arizona or you're going to Dallas or you're going to California, in and out Burger's got to be on that list. You know, you got to start planning out those things. Then you got to think, okay, from this day to this day, we got to do this, and this day to that day, we got to do that. And we have this whole agenda and we wear ourselves out. We don't like to really sit back and unwind. We don't really want to hit in these buttons as we are talking, the stop button or the play pause button. We, we don't want to just stop and listen. We don't want to, to just hit pause and, and take some time to actually play. And so for the next two weeks, we're going to talk about that. And as we talk about that, we're, we're going to, to be diving into some, some biblical principles on how we apply that to our lives. But before we do, I know school's only been out for a couple of weeks, but I'm going to throw a little pop quiz your way today, okay? So I apologize for that. Um, but as I throw this pop quiz your way, I, I want to ask you a very simple question. It's an easy one, I hope. How many of you guys, by raising your hands, believe that murder is wrong? Okay, good. Those of you who don't, we need to have a little counseling session afterwards, okay? We'll, we'll, we'll talk through that here eventually. How many of you guys think stealing is wrong? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you think if I were to whip up an idol right here, right now, and I put it up here and say, guys, we're going to sing our worship to this idol, and we're going to, to praise it today, how many would say that is wrong and you'd get up and leave? Okay, good. Those of you against, what's that? It would be my last Sunday. That's okay. It's okay. I need to sit back and unwind, so it's summer, right? But um, the, the thing is we look at that, we begin to think about those things. Those are all ones that come right to our minds. Yeah, th they're wrong. What about adultery? What if I said, hey, you shouldn't be seducing your neighbor's husband or wife? Everybody think that's wrong? Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Once again, anybody who didn't raise their hands will have a counseling time after this, okay? I promise, and we're going to walk through that. Why do you think those are wrong? God said they were. Where did he say they were? In the law, in the Bible, in the Ten Commandments, right? Now I want you to stop and think about it. In this pop quiz, there's a second question that goes with it. Of the Ten Commandments, what is the one that everybody's okay with breaking that wouldn't really raise their hand when I said, is it wrong to do this? You want a, you want a hint? It's number four. Number four, Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. It is remembering the Sabbath to hit stop, to take a break, to pause and play. Why do we have such a hard time with the Sabbath? You know, a lot of times when you say the word, remember the Sabbath, what's your first reaction? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? My guess is, is go to church is on it. Or the people I've talked to about it, just kind of getting some things and listen to as well, it seemed that the Sabbath was an Old Testament law. And it doesn't apply anymore. And, it, and it's kind of old school. I mean, we sang hymns this morning. You want old school. It kind of falls into that side of things, not the, the new school way. Hey, we got 24-7. We're going to use all of it kind of mentality. And people will use that as an excuse and use that as an argument. We're going to dive into it. And people might go, well, you know, being the Sabbath thing and, and honoring that, it's almost legalistic. But we never say that about the other nine. You never go, oh, you know what? I murdered that guy. But the reason why? We never say that, but yet we have an excuse for this one for whatever reason. I, I began to thinking about it. When the fourth commandment simply reads, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. He's saying, don't make God an afterthought. And for the last couple of weeks, we kind of touched on that. Don't, don't make God an afterthought. He, he is the primary reason. You know, it's, it's probably the one commandment we don't feel guilty about breaking. If you steal, if you kill, if you commit adultery, my guess is you're usually going to feel guilty about it. But this one, for whatever reason, we kind of pass it off. We don't think it's that bad. Yet, if we don't follow it, if we don't apply it, it is going to lead to some major problems later on in your life. 
Somehow we don't connect the dots. Somehow we don't think, you know, if I don't do this, then I'll do this. When I'm sitting in counseling therapy because my marriage is falling apart, if I'm sitting in counseling therapy because my mind has just crumbled around me, if those things are happening, I never go, you know what, I should have done the Sabbath. No, that's not our general reaction. But those are the kind of things that happen because, see, Sabbath, it talks a lot and really focuses a lot about our work. And I don't know about you, but I like to work. I find satisfaction in work. I enjoy doing what I do. I enjoy mowing the grass. I enjoy washing cars. I enjoy pulling weeds. I know those are all strange things, and you're all going to invite me over this afternoon, but i got to take my Sabbath, okay? So, but but the, the thing is, is I enjoy those kind of things, and I really do enjoy doing this right here. I enjoy investing in people's lives. I enjoy seeing life change happen. I enjoy helping people take the next step in their faith journey towards Jesus. I enjoy that. I find that satisfaction. But the whole commandment of the Sabbath really focuses on our work habits. And the problem with our our work is a lot of times, even though we enjoy it, it also brings us stress. Would you say your job, your work, your things bring you stress, the things that you have to get done, even if it's just things around the house? Those are the things that kind of cause us to get a little bit. Everybody has that pile of laundry that causes them that just a little bit of stress that's over there in the corner that you put it on the chair. You're not even sure if it's clean or dirty, but you're going to leave it there for a little bit longer because I just can't deal with it right now. And we have these things in our lives that continue to do that. And my guess is a lot of the things that, that cause us pain further down the road is how much time and effort we put into our work. I mean, when we're stressed, we rarely say it's because I missed the Sabbath. When we're stressed, we say it's because we have too much work. Even though we don't immediately connect the dots between Sabbath and work and rest, I want you to see something. I think the reason where we, we have this Sabbath and we have these dots to connect is, first of all, is this. Our work causes us stress for two primary reasons, and that is, Number one, we depend on our work to provide for our needs in life. We, we depend on our work to provide for our needs in life. If we don't work, guess what we don't have? Money. And if we don't have money, then we die. Or at least that's what we think. Th- th- that's our immediate thing. I- I'm not going to get to go on that nice vacation. I'm not going to get to drive that nice car. I'm not going to get to have the nice clothes. I'm going to be wearing hand-me-downs and driving a clunker, and I'm going to have to stay in New Mexico my whole life. And all of those things begin to weigh, and they cause us stress, so we have to have it. And guess what? We've been doing it since we were little kids, haven't we? Haven't we told kids, hey, you need to do good in school so you can do good in college, so you can get a good job, so you can have money and live a good life? And when we don't have those things, we don't see those things playing out the way that we think they should, we begin to get a bit stressed. I mean, the only person that isn't stressed is that person that's independently wealthy. And if that's you, man, we need to talk after service. Okay, we're going to have that same counseling session with you as well. But the reality is, is we get caught up in this idea that if I don't work, then I'm not going to have a good life and we stress out about it we stress out about having a job not having a job losing our job not making the sale not getting that raise these are things that cause us stress so we work harder we put more hours in and it takes away from the things that god wants us to do second thing we see is work also stresses out because we find our identity in work since we were little don't we find our identity in work we had graduations a couple weeks ago how many graduates had a title and an award and a thing to Give them some a sense of identity, of who they are. And we do it even with work. See, we, we have two questions when we generally meet somebody. First question is, what's your name? Second question is, what do you do? And then we size somebody up by what they do. We size them up by what they do. And if we do something that seems to be important, like we're in the doctor or lawyer or, or pastor, I think, um, you know, if we say something that's important, we're, we're proud to say that. But if we have kind of a lowly job, we kind of mutter it. I started thinking about all the lowly jobs I've had in my life. My first job was making popcorn in a movie theater. That's not something you're like, hey, I'm a popcorn maker. That, that's not something we get really super excited about. It. I was a busser at Red Robin. Uh, I pulled weeds in manure fields. One of those things you just don't share with people often, okay? I, I literally went into human excrement and pulled weeds so you could sell it as fertilizer to farmers because they don't want 
to sell fertilizer that has weed seeds in it. That was my job. And after a day it rained, it's not a good thing to be doing. You don't want to explain that to people. That's not, that's not one of the jobs we're ultimately proud of. I, I was a car salesman. I actually captured gophers at golf courses. Yes, I was Bill Murray. Jerome and I did it together, so it was great. We had all kinds of fun. But these aren't the jobs you're like, yes, this is who I am. But yet when we have our jobs, we try and find our identity in those things. And, and not having that good job, having a lowly work ethic or having just lowly work kind of gives us low self-worth. Now, should it? No, it shouldn't. But that is what happens to us. Work causes stress when it says, here's who you are. This is your identity. And work causes stress to say, you need it so you can be provided for. The thing that we see here is, is the commandment here that is number four, addresses both of them. As a matter of fact, let me read it for you. If you have your Bibles with you, I would love for you to open up to Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 8. And this is the Ten Commandments, and yes, it is the Old Testament. If you don't know where it is, it's the second book of the Old Testament. If you only have a Bible that has a New Testament, you're going to be in Mark, and you're not going to find Exodus. So just go find Exodus back in the back, or if you don't have it with you, it's here on the screen. It says this simply, remember. It means to observe. It means to hit stop. It means to hit pause. Remember on the Sabbath day to keep it holy, to set it apart, to set it apart from the other days that you have. You are to labor six days and do all your work, but on the seventh day, it's the Sabbath, and it's the Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work, you, your son or daughter, your male or female servant, your livestock, or the resident alien who is within your city gates. You know who this includes? Everyone. It means that you don't get to be the boss and say, well, since I can't work today, I'm going to give the job to somebody else, and then you worry whether or not they're doing it. It's supposed to be no work. Don't do anything. And it says this, verse 11, For the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and declared it holy. So in this commandment, God drops the purposes of the Sabbath right in our lap. The what and the why. The what and the why. The what, simply put, is this. Take one day. Take one day a week and do really nothing that is work-related. Do really nothing that is work-related. Now, we can get into all the Old Testament rules and all the things that said, oh, you couldn't lift a finger and doing this, you couldn't do this, but you could do that. No, this is, don't do anything that's work-related. Don't be something that's going to consume you and take your focus off of God. The what is take time and reflect on God and His creation. That's why he mentions here that, that God did created the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them in six days. He focuses and says, focus on God. Focus on the creation. Focus on the things that are around you. If you want to go for a hike, go for a hike. If you want to do the thing, see what is out there. See what God has done. And remember that God is the main thing. I'm not sure if you've ever heard this before, but it says the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Guess what the main thing is? It's God. And that's what the Sabbath is for, is to bring us back around. The Sabbath is a purposeful interruption to your calendar. The things that drive your calendar don't get to be on the Sabbath. And that might be work, that might be activities, that might be your kids' activities, that might be, you name it. It's gone. Take it off. Now that's a hard thing to say, because we live in a 24-7 society. It was different for them, right? We'll get to that here shortly. Main thing, the what. Keep your focus on God and everything he created, that God is God and that he is the provider and he is the sustainer. And that's why we have the why. See, there's a why in here as well. The what is take the one thing off. Why? Well, one practical reason, we need rest. We need rest. There's not a single person here that's God, right? God's the only thing that doesn't need rest. Only being that doesn't need rest. We need rest. We weren't built to go 24-7. As a matter of fact, we are kind of like a car. Sometimes you just need to get refueled. Other times you need to go in for full maintenance. We are like that. And we have to remember, we practically reason we need to rest. I mean, God said take a day off. If God said it, shouldn't we do it? I mean, it seems kind of practical. The second part is, is this. There's a spiritual reason. We need to refocus both daily and weekly. 
both daily and weekly, we need to focus on God. We, as human beings, have this weird thing called short-term memory. We have a tendency to forget, and we have a tendency to drift. I was telling uh, Jerome this this week. One of the things that I loved about summer was doing summer youth trips, and we'd always go to the beach in California or in Texas or something like that. And in the process of going to the beach, I'd always, as a youth pastor, take a giant flag and put it in the beach. You know why I would do that? Because the kids would get out there, and they'd play in the water. And before they knew it, they had drifted down because the current had taken them that way. And they didn't know where we were at. So we always had a place that would say, this is where you need to focus at. If you can't see the flag anymore, get out of the water and start walking back towards it. I want you to be able to see the flag. Well, I think that's kind of what God has going on here too. Refocus. Because there's things in our life when our life becomes so wrapped up in work, so everything about what I have to do, that we start to forget God. And we drift away from Him. So we need to stop, and we need to stop often and refocus on Him. So refocus on what exactly? Well, verse 11 says, the creator and the creation. Everything comes from God. Everything's going back to God. He owns it all, and it's all ultimately for his purpose and his glory. But how many times do we think about that? How many times do we let our lives be dictated by that? And here's a crazy thing. See, Moses doesn't just tell us this in Exodus. A lot of times we see the Ten Commandments, we're like, okay, yeah, that's old school. But he also tells it a second time in what's called Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy actually means the second law. And in Deuteronomy, he repeats it again. He also repeats it again in Leviticus. But let's take a look at what he says in Deuteronomy. He says this in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 12. Be careful to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Not suggested, commanded. He repeats that command in, from Exodus in verses 13 and 14. But if you jump to verse 15, it says this. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out of there with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. A couple things here. One, as a slave, do you think they ever got a day off? Do you think they ever got a moment off? Absolutely not. So they're excited about this. This is a gift from God. But what else are they supposed to remember? Not just that God is the creator, but that God is also the redeemer. He is the salvation. He's the one that brought them out of slavery and gave them freedom, that God loved them enough, that he was compassionate enough towards them, that he called them out, and he had a purpose for their life that wasn't in Egyptian slavery. Guess what? We may say this is an Old Testament teaching, but that is still the same today, that we have been brought out of slavery, that we have been brought out of bondage to freedom through Jesus Christ, because he loved us and he had a plan for us. That is why we need the Sabbath. That is why we need to put this in practice. That is why we need to focus often, daily and weekly in this. See, the Israelites, they drifted back and forth from God to themselves. I mean, you can look throughout the Old Testament, and you can see one time they're following God, next time they're following idols. Then God sends in leaders, and he sends in prophets, and he sends in judges to bring things back around. And sometimes they came back around, and sometimes they didn't. Sometimes they praised God for who he was, and they came back around, and things were great. Other times, they praised themselves, and things weren't so great. Can I ask you, have you ever seen that in your own life? Because we have a tendency to do that same thing. We have a tendency to move in that same direction. We have memory problems just like they did. We get wrapped in up, up in ourselves just like they did. That's why this is still for us. That's why when we focus on our work week all week long and the stressors that become, we begin to let that take over our weekend. We begin to check our phones even during church to say, oh, did I get that email? Did I get that text? I'm one that is terrible about my phone. I hate it when there is a red number on my iPhone. If it says there's a message, guess what I got to do? I got to answer it. If there's an email, I've got to read it because I can't have numbers on my phone. And I know you can turn off notifications, but that's cheating. See, so um, I, I don't want those things. And that's an immediate thing for me. That's why I got to say, I got to unplug because work can replace God. And it has a tendency to do so. And guess what my work is? My work is for God. But yet my work can replace God. And guess what? Yours can too. So we have to take a step back and say, does my work really provide for me? Does my work really give my identity? Or do I remember that God is ultimately my sustainer, that God is ultimately my provider, that God is ultimately the one who gave me my identity through Jesus Christ, like Ephesians talks about? At what point in time do we click with that? 
At what point in time do we say, you know what, I'm going to take a step back? See, there's a hard reality that not just work does this. Stuff can do it. Kids can do it. Entertainment can do it. Our kids' activities, our activities can do it. They can drive us. They can dominate us. They can do all of the things. See, man, I'll tell you, it's amazing how wrapped up in that kind of stuff we can get. I'm going to tell you a quick little story here. I did a wedding yesterday. It was the most unusual wedding, most story-provoking wedding I've ever done. It was in the East Mountains. I'm not sure if you saw the weather in the East Mountains, but when I arrived, it was hailing and raining and thunder and lightning. And I'll tell you what, this place is called Nature Point. Gorgeous place. Amazing. Uh, And the wedding was all set up for outside. But they had a great inside plan. And this inside plan uh, it was well set up. It, it was, uh, had a nice fireplace backdrop, but it didn't have the fountain backdrop like outside did. The wedding was supposed to start at 2. About 2.45, the bride was still getting ready. I'm kind of like, all right, let's, let's encourage this along just a little bit here. I got other things to do this afternoon. I'm out here in the East Mountains. It's great and all. But So wedding time comes. It's sprinkling. Radar says big rainstorm's coming. So coordinator, bride, groom, we're going to move it inside. Everybody comes inside. During the wedding, I do my little kind of, I don't know what you want to call it, sermonette, if you will, in it. And then I read the vows to the groom and say, if you agree with me, please say, I do. He says, I do. I read the vows to the bride. And I say, if you agree with me, please say, I do. She grabbed the bouquet and walked out. And I... It's difficult for me to be speechless, but I went, (laughs) and I looked at the groom, and he looked at me, and I'm like, so we just stood there silent. I mean, everybody's just looking, and she just, out. And I went, I'm like, okay, put on my quick thinking shoes here. So I go out, and I'm like, where's she at? And somebody's like, oh, she got in the car and left. I'm like, she's gone? Like, what? That was my thinking. So I go out, and I'm like, no, she's still in her car, still right there. So I go out there, and I'm like, hey, what's going on? She's like, nobody's listening to me. I'm like, I just wanted you to say I do. I would have been listening to you. It would have been fine. I'm standing there, and she's like, I want to have pre-first look pictures. Girls, you know what that is. I didn't have a clue what that meant. But, um, and I wanted to have my wedding outside. I've been planning this for two years, and I wanted to have my wedding outside. I said, that, that's it? She said, yep, that's it. I'm like, do you still want to get married? She's like, oh, yeah, I still love him. And, blah, blah. and I'm like, oh, okay, we can work with that. that. That's a good thing. So about an hour and 45 minutes later, after all the storms had passed, after we shifted everything, we got everything back outside, after talking the husband down, when he's like, well, she kind of left when she was supposed to say, I do. How am I supposed to take that? I'm like, I don't know how to answer that question. I, I apologize to you for that. I don't know. I said, I've been doing like, 100 weddings in my life, first time, okay? So you were my teaching one, and by the way, you'll be a sermon illustration tomorrow. But the, <laughs> the, the thing is, we get so wrapped up in the things that we want that I think we miss the things that matter most. And we get so wrapped up, and, and so, and of course, she hadn't eaten yet, and, and, and it had been all day, and, and hadn't drank anything, and she had a headache, and all the things that kind of go with the... The, that, that mentality of, I, I wouldn't call it quite Bridezilla, but there is a TV show called that that kind of fits into that pattern. And, and, and so walking her through that and talking her through that and talking him through that and bringing them together and kind of having like a premarital, like right before the marital counseling time. And, and we kind of walked through everything. And, and by the end, it was all good and everything was fine. But I, I got to thinking, I'm like, 20 years from now, you're going to laugh about this. I hope. Because, man, that's, that's a heavy load right there. And I began to think, at what point in time do we do that with us? Where we just want it our way. And we get so wrapped up in us and we forget to refocus on what it's all about. Because even a wedding in itself is all about the picture of the bride of Christ and Christ coming together in a covenant. That's what it's about. I, don't, I even told it because the, the guy told me, he's like, I don't care if we get married in my backyard. I'm like, what would be cheaper? But um, you know, the reality is, is, is we get so caught up in the things that we want and we, we miss the things that are most important. 
So what am I getting at here? This fourth commandment, hit stop. It was given to us to keep work from letting ourselves and our work becoming God. That's what it was for. And number four really flows down from number one. Actually, all nine flow down from number one. And you know what number one is? There is no other gods. I'm it. Nothing gets to be in my place. That's what he says, including work, including the things that we think we find our worth in, the things we think we find our identity in, the things we think we find our provision in. He said, you know what, guys? The purpose of the Sabbath is also the point of the Sabbath, and it's Jesus Christ. It's us to refocus on who God is and the, the amazing thing about Jesus. You know that the whole scripture does that? Old Testament points towards him. Gospel is all about him. New Testament points back at him. It's a meta narrative. It, 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 he is throughout the whole thing. But sometimes we miss that because we begin to focus on work as our primary focus and not him. God wants us to focus on him as our source of identity and what we need for the future. Can I, can I ask you a question that I always want you to think about? Where exactly do you find your worth? Where do you find your worth at? The, the, the natural answer should be Jesus. You're in here. That, that's a church answer. That's, that's just the one it's supposed to be. That's where we're supposed to find it. But oftentimes, is that where we find our worth at? Or is it in all of these other things? If it's not in God, if it's not in Jesus, can I tell you you are setting yourself up to fail? This is a pre-warning to that. Who do you trust with your future? Who do you trust with your kids' future? You know, a lot of times, even when I talk to people who, who have skipped uh, meeting together, who have skipped getting involved in church because their, their kids' schedules have, have driven them to say, well, they're going to get a scholarship someday. Do you not believe that God is in charge and that you have to force a scholarship on them? Who is in control? Do you trust God with your future or do you trust yourself, your job, your school, or any of those other things? Again, if it's not God, I'm telling you right now, you are setting yourself up to fail. God has given us a command to rest and refocus in him. Why? Because without this command, we let ourselves get wrapped up in work or our activities or whatever you want to fill in the blank with. We wrap ourselves up in that. And, and here's a quick little side note. God's given us work to be our main instrument for him to meet our physical needs. How many other things in our life do we begin to worship like we do with work instead of God that meets our physical needs? There are people out there that worship food. There's people that, that worship money. There's people that worship sex. There are people that, that, that worship the gifts and not the giver. Sabbath refocuses us on the giver. How hard is it to take a day off every week? If I said, okay, what we're going to do is next Sunday, I want you on Saturday night, because Romans chapter 14 actually says the Sabbath is a 24-hour period. It doesn't say specific, specify a day in the New Testament. We can get into that more next week as we talk about the practice of the Sabbath. But what I want you to look at today is if I said next week we're going to on Saturday night at 6, we're going to go till Sunday night at 6, I want you to focus on the Sabbath. And I want you to come to worship. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to be a part of that. But the rest of, of the time, I don't want you to be thinking about work either. I just want you to, to just focus on God. You know what the first question we'd all ask would be? Well, what are we supposed to do? Well, I already gave you the answer. Well, I know we're supposed to focus on God, but what are we supposed to do? You know why we say that? Because we're driven to do. We're driven to work. We're not driven to rest. That is not who we are. That's not what society says. How hard is it to take a day off and rest and refocus on God? To completely unplug from everything that is driving you in the other way. That's a, that's a heavy question to ask. And you know, if you decided that this week is the week you wanted to do it, which I would love for you to be able to do that, but as we ask that, how do we practice the Sabbath? Any of you play sports? At least in high school? Used to? Okay, good, good, good. We have some used to, so that's good. Has been, so that's me. I fall in that category as well. Um, anybody play an instrument? Okay. Okay, we got some instrument people in here. How many people are uh, working out at the gym? Okay, yeah, you don't have to raise your hand. It's fine. Um, <laughs> how many people thought about a diet at the beginning of the year, but now it's June and that's all gone? All right, okay, okay. When you are getting into the gym, when you are playing a sport, when you are playing an instrument, when you are on a diet, when you are doing these different things, the first day 
is the hardest, isn't it? Because we're not used to it. We're, we're, we haven't practiced. I mean, any instrument? Well, I have all the desire in the world. Someday I want to learn how to play the bass guitar. You know when that day is going to come? Never. But I have that desire. I wouldn't mind learning to play some different sports. But until I actually take that first step, until I actually say, hey, I'm going to go on a diet. I, I'm not going to eat all the junky food. That's great you know, until junky food gets put in my way, until something else distracts me from that. The same thing with the Sabbath. I have every desire in my life to follow the Sabbath because I truly believe, as we're going to look here in a second, that it's going to benefit me, benefit me more than working seven days a week. However, I also come up with the same excuse going, well, I was going to, but... I get distracted. I have things that get in my way. Uh, you know, accountability is huge in all areas of our instruction. Who's holding you accountable in those things? If you go to the gym with somebody else, do you have more desire to go afterwards? If you're on a diet with somebody else and you're like, mm, that donut looks really good, and they're like, mm, -mm and you're like, ah, I'm still going to eat it. But uh, how many times does accountability help us in that step? See, the big reason why I believe you should be part of worship and be here, like when I said, if you're going to take that 24 hours, be, make this part of it, have somebody in here to help you keep you accountable. Take the next step and get involved in connection and, and, and be in a smaller group. Because in here, you know, we, we've got 80 people or so in here, and, and you take that step down, and all of a sudden you have 12 people in the connection group. You're going to have better accountability. Take the next step down into a discipleship group, and you have one to five that are they're going to, to really hold you accountable. See, these, these things up here, these Paragon Church core statements, value statements that we have, those aren't just there for pretty picture. They don't just add color to the stage. It's about going and finding people. It's about connecting. It's about serving. It's about giving. It's about growing. That's what we're about as a church. That's what we desire to see in every person that walks in the door is that they get these things. And part of the reason why is because we need to refocus on God and we can't do it by ourselves. The whole goal of our church is to move somebody closer to Jesus. Those are the steps we take to do it. Found people, they find people. Are we finding people or are we distracted in that? Save people, serve people. Are we serving? If you are saved, are you using your gifts and your talents? I can't do life alone. We need that accountability. Do we have it? I can't outgive God. You think the Sabbath is about giving to God? You better believe it. You're giving one seventh of your week. And growing people change, discipleship. What if we put those into practice? How would this church be different? What would it look like? Stew on that. We're going to talk about more of that when we hit fast forward. There's really so much to all of this, but really I want one statement and one question to wrap us up. The one statement is this. We talk about the Sabbath. And as we talk about the Sabbath, don't get caught up in the legalistic part of it all. The do's and the don'ts and the how's and the where's and the who's. As we dive deeper into that idea of practice, we're going to talk about more next week. But this is what I want you to know. Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament. And when he fulfilled the Old Testament, he fulfilled it right down to the last jot and right down to the last tittle, which means he fulfilled the Sabbath. We are not bound by the technicalities of the Sabbath. However, God didn't just say, all right, throw all that stuff away. Those rules, they are not the point. Jesus is the point, but those rules keep us on the path to get to the point. There are guardrails that keep us from wandering from side to side, and the Sabbath is a perfect example of that. So we don't just throw it out. And like I said, we'll talk more about it next week, but here's one of the crazy things. Did you know that the Sabbath in the Old Testament was actually celebrated when people were following God? When David said, your law is like the honey that is on my lips, that doesn't sound dreaded. I like honey. When he says, I lie in bed awake at night and I think about your law. That wasn't because he was trying to obey it. It was because he knew that God loved him to give him those directions to point him in the direction that he needed to go. And the second question is, as we, we talk about this, refocusing and resting. Do you trust God? Do you trust God? The immediate answer in here is yes, because you're in church. But does your lifestyle say so? It's a simple question I think we need to answer. Do we trust him to give him one-seventh of our lives? He actually wants all of our life. 
But if you just gave him one day and how that would change things. Think of the Israelites. God made them give one day off a week and do nothing. That's a big deal because they didn't have refrigerators. And they didn't have faucets. And they didn't have all the modern technology that we have. They had to work daily to get their stuff. To say, I'm going to stop was a survival mechanism. It it was one of the things to say, I need to keep pushing myself. But they said, you know what? I can always do more. And there's always something more to do. But I'm going to cut my productivity by one-seventh. And I'm going to trust God for the rest. That's a big step. And the reality is, I don't think God ever said, I want you to push yourself as hard as you possibly can. But yet we do it. He wants to say, I want you to say you have what you have because God is a great provider. And I actually did less, but God made up the difference. It helps us refocus on him and put our focus where it needs to be. God says on the seventh day, do nothing. It's not because you can afford to do nothing. It's because he wants to give us a space where we can trust him. And he wants to give us a space where he can multiply our efforts from the six days. I truly believe that if we take a Sabbath, and and this is something I desperately need to put into practice, but I truly believe if you take a Sabbath, God is going to multiply the other six days more. Want a prime example? Anybody want Chick-fil-A today? I do. But guess what? It's not open. You know why? Because it's Sunday, and they take a Sabbath. And guess what? They're the third most profit-producing restaurant in America, yet they take a day off. I think God has multiplied it and continued to bless them. I think he does the same thing in our lives. The only thing is, it's one thing to say, yeah, I believe it. It's a totally different thing to say, I actually trust it, and I put my trust in it. The Sabbath in our time isn't the only place. That whole idea of I can't outgive God, it's not just time where we give it. I'm not sure if you remember our five T's. It was time, talent, treasures, temple, and testimony how we give those things and how God can multiply it. Well, guess what? Treasure in there, that's money. You don't think the tithe is something? I'm not sure how many of you guys know what the tithe is. The tithe is giving 10% of your income towards God, to God, because it's all his anyway. Here's the crazy thing. 10%? Are you kidding me? I'm living paycheck to paycheck. There is absolutely no way I can afford to give 10%. I can't give any percent. I need to pay my bills. I need to, I need to, I need to. You think God said give 10% because he thought you had 10 extra percent laying around? What did he say? I want you to trust me. That's it. Time, talent, treasure. He he wants you to do that. How about this? Do you trust him with your time? Do you trust him with your, your treasure? Do you trust him at night when you close your eyes to go to sleep? That's another area. I didn't sleep worth a darn last night. I was just thinking about that wedding forever. <laughs> I'm like, how did I not see that coming? And I just laid there and I thought about it and I'm like, my goal in life when I do a wedding is not to screw it up. I mean, in all honesty, I'm like, this is the one day they're going to remember for the rest of their lives. I script it. I read everything off of it. That went way off script for me. To start completely over, I'm like, now I've got to give a whole new sermonette about how life can be messy and life doesn't always go as planned. I don't know if they heard it or not, but I'm like, I'm saying it. But I laid there awake thinking, you know what that did? Just made me more tired this morning. Didn't change anything. That's why he says here in Psalm 127, I think this is one we might actually dive into with our soundtracks to the soul in July. It says, unless the Lord builds a house, his builders labor over it in vain. Unless the Lord watches over a city, the watchman stays alert in vain. In vain you get up early and stay up late, working hard to have enough food. Yes, he gives sleep to the ones that he loves. He gives sleep. Oh, man, we should tattoo that one on us. I just want sleep. Oh, God says in Psalm 127, I get sleep because he loves me. Just rest. Rest in him. Trust him. Do you trust him enough that when you close your eyes tonight that he's still in control? I sure hope so because he's in control whether you trust him or not. We have to take that step, though whether it's things that we think we can control or things we can't control, when we come contr- close our eyes, I truly believe we're reminding ourselves, I'm not God. He doesn't need to sleep. He's got it. He's got it in his hands. One last thing, daily Sabbath, or what we like to call quiet time. I told you to focus on him daily and to focus on him weekly. How many of us take quiet time? I sure hope you do. 
But I'll tell you one thing that gets in the way of my quiet time is my time. Or what I think is my lack of time. My children, my work, my text messages, my emails. What's the first thing you do when you wake up and you turn the alarm off on your phone? Do you check emails? Do you check text messages? Do you check the game score from the night before? Do you, wh what is it that you, you check? And then we go, oh, God, sorry, I don't have enough time for you because everything else got in the way. I actually was listening to a uh, podcast this week that was talking about quiet time and really just, they actually called it a mini Sabbath. And the, producti the productivity of people increased and their stress levels decreased when they were in the Word daily. Not just reading for a check mark, but reading for actual fulfillment from the author, from the giver, from the sustainer. Like I said, we're going to talk more about practice next week, but if there's one thing that I'd like to challenge you today to walk away with is this. Will you trust God? Will you trust God with your soul? Will you trust God with your life? Will you trust God with all your heart? Will you trust God with your mind and your strength? You know, when Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, it's because he knew our heart. He knew we'd be to drift away from him. So we trust in him and we focus on him and we refocus on him and we refocus on him again. It changes everything. Can I challenge you today to trust God? Many of you in here have trusted God with your salvation. You have trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you have not, I would love to talk to you about what that looks like. But if you have, can we take it a step beyond just that day you prayed that prayer and make it a lifestyle? Can we begin to look at that and begin to talk, even as we talk about practice next week, put it into practice? Let's pray together. Father, thank you again for who you are. And thank you for the way you speak into our lives and continue to challenge our souls and continue to challenge our minds to grow closer to you. Because we know it's more than just that first step in the door. It's more than just getting saved. It's more than just getting baptized. It's more than just, just those initial things. There's so much more in being trusting of you and being obedient to your commands and following after you and chasing after you. Not because of legalism, but because you loved us enough to send your son, Jesus, for our, for our souls, for our lives to build a church that was wanting you more. We know you are the great provider. We know that you are our identity, but oftentimes, God, we forget. Today, I hope, was a reminder, and throughout this week, we have that reminder. God, use this time to glorify yourself, and we pray that we can put our trust in you just even a little bit more. Just take that next little step to trust you more. We pray it in your name. Amen. I'm going to slide over here to the uh, Paragon Church sign. There's a cross over there, and I want to meet you at the foot of the cross just to talk to you about trust. Maybe you haven't put your trust in Jesus. Today would be a great day to do it. Maybe you haven't put your trust in God saying, yep, I'm willing to give that 10%. Let's talk about that. Uh, I'm willing to give one-seventh of my week, whatever it might be. Let's talk about it over there. Or if you feel so neat, just talk about it to him right here, right now in your seats. I'll be over there, though. Hebrews 10, <clears throat> verse 10 says, We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Jumping down to verse 14 says, For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, he has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful.